Welcome to the Invincible Innovation Show, the podcast for changemakers. Each week, I talk to the most fascinating entrepreneurs and innovation leaders about innovation, strategy, and design. Hey, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about the creativity and its importance in times of change. Welcome to Invincible Innovation Live Show. I'm glad to see you here. I'm Adima Zolkario, innovation and value creation expert, and I'll be your host. And today with me, I'm so happy to have Janice Francisco. Hi, Janice. Hi, Addie. Very nice to be here with you today. Yeah, Janice is the founder and CEO of Bridgepoint Effects, and I'm so happy that she joined us today. We're live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook, and we're uh, really like you to join us and ask questions, and we'd love to hear your thoughts, so feel free. Um, Jenny, so we can start. What is the most important skills and competencies to an innovation leader? Oh, wow. Well, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion about what these are. And if you ask people, what are they? They're all going to give you different answers. But mm-hmm. what I found was uh, I, I went on this search myself because in a lot of the work that we do, we need to help people. Um, make and, and reach those uh, competencies and, and get the skills they need. So there was a great piece of work research I'd like to talk about that happened in Canada, uh, where I'm from with the conference board. And they did a, a search uh, with government as well as private sector. And they looked at what are the skills that people need to really be able to contribute to innovation. And we found they've been a fantastic model because they break down and, and kind of hit on key areas areas that we all have to develop some flexibility in with innovation so uh, the first one was uh, that we need to have creativity isn't that a good thing we're talking about that today yeah Uh, yeah. along with problem solving and the ability to engage in continuous improvement. A uh, second one is relationship building and communication skills. So think about it. Innovation is definitely a team sport. It's something that requires a lot of collaboration. And if we don't know how to reach across, you know, the, the silos to the partners that we have or the people that we're working with, it becomes very difficult to do that well. Um, another thing we need is, Is risk assessment as well as risk taking skills because a innovation is all about those risks and going off into places that we haven't been before getting comfortable with the uncertainty and ambiguity of that and we really need a way to be able to manage that for ourselves and with the people that we're working with and finally sure. it's not really innovation until it gets mm-hmm. implemented right <laughs> so yeah we have to be able to take all of those ideas and get them implemented sure so those are some of the things What I would call the technical skills that we need and the other thing I think we need to understand is that there are emotional skills or emotional competencies that we need because innovation is by no means something that is completely logical we don't only do it in a, in a you know in a, in a fully logical analytical way it's very much an emotional journey and it's something that we need to you Uh, tap into the passion in our heart it's right that's what keeps us fed and that's what keeps us able to keep moving through that so I find uh, having some of the the critical emotional skills uh, one of them is around mindfulness if we don't understand how we're feeling and where we're going through that process and what's happening as we go through it to the people around us if we're unable to be present in that moment so we can make good decisions it becomes very difficult to navigate that process yeah. And then and, I, you know, and I, and I think what you said about the emotional, I, I know I cut you in the middle, but you'll, you'll continue after us about the emotional capacities. I feel that right now it's even more important because we feel that people are anxious and afraid during this COVID crisis and the ability to really take it in and re recalibrate yourself, I would say, uh, and to manage everything without being like fear and, taking over and deciding everything it, it's so important for for leaders and people in general and if they don't have this capacity to really just really hold it and and understand that yeah it's it's a challenging time but we can do it it's it's so hard for them to really go through this roller coaster right now it is it, it really is and I think the more we're able to be in touch with that and you know related to that, The more we're able to connect to the meaningful purpose for what it is that we're doing, 
the easier it becomes to navigate that change as well as, you know, that roller coaster that, that we are in, invariably going to go through. And I think that's also what keeps our wits about us uh, with some of the other uh, skills that come into play. And, and those are around, you know, being able to uh, tolerate complexity, uh, being able to tolerate ambiguity and, and be okay with the fact that we don't have all the answers and to understand that through that process of moving through innovation, we will start to get the answers that we need. Yeah. I think that in general, what we see right now in people's lives and in businesses that you need to have to be able to let things unfold in front of you. And you cannot control so many factors in your life in general, and you need to know how to work in these uncertainties. And there are many of them right now, um, which is very important. So through all the, the skills and competencies you just mentioned, why creativity is so important for change? Well, I think there's a few reasons, and I, I want to I put this into a context first. Let's, let's think about the fact that change is a creative process, right? In order to change something, there's a combination of learning as well as innovation that you need to go through, right? We're, we're innovating something when we're making a change. And so that in itself is very much a creative process. So when we want to do that well, and we want to do that with our wits about us, and we want to do that um, exercising uh, our ability to have some influence on where we're going and how, how we're feeling through that, we've got to be able to connect into that creativity. Now, you had talked earlier about many people are working from a place of fear right now. And, you know, I don't want to say it's necessarily the opposite, but it's certainly not creative to be in fight, flight, or freeze type of responses when we are looking to create change. And so we've got to find a way to trigger ourselves to move out of that place of feeling you know, like we've got to run from something that isn't what we want to have happen. And we've got to be able to use our imagination to connect to something that we do want to happen so that we can create the energy to move us towards that. And so without creativity, I think it becomes really difficult to do that. Yeah. I think that in a sense, being anxious and afraid is a bit contradictory to to... to Uh, creativity as I see it it's like you have blinders and you only see that when you're afraid you just you know need to hold your uh, resources really tight and when you're creative you have this open-mindedness that allows you to see things um, wider with more possibilities and with an open heart actually and this is really needed right especially you know like in times of, of crisis change and and things that are unexpected unexpectable in general right i i i love what you said there about uh the openness and with an open heart and i certainly loved how you know the, the way that you were describing it like we get minors it's like you know it's it, it's like having what i call narrow focus versus open to possibilities focus you know are you able to to do that and and can you connect to that you know to that heart energy that gives you that passion to make that change the i think one of the things that's really interesting is to to recognize that you know without without being able to create that passion without being able to understand what we're propelling ourselves towards it becomes difficult to actually create that. We've got to have a vision of what it is we want. And I, you know, I don't like getting caught up in the, oh, what's the vision? What's the vision? That's not what I mean. It's we've got to be able to hold something around what is the meaningful purpose for doing all of this stuff that quite frankly, it's hard. <laughs> right? It is hard. Right? Well, we're I totally changing, agree. We're changing <laughs> habits. We're changing thinking. We're changing process. We're, there's so much we're changing. We're changing perceptions. We're changing assumptions. And that takes energy. And if we don't have something to tether ourselves to, it becomes very difficult to do that well. Yeah. Don't you find that people 
everyone finds change uh, in general difficult and they try to avoid it, but especially changing your mindset, changing the way you perceive the world. So don't you find that sometimes it's really hard to make people understand that they should think about changing and it will be beneficial for them uh, in the process and, and have the results, even financial and business results out of it? You know... When you say that, it, it's like we can convince someone else about the logic around changing. And I don't think we can. I, 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 I think that's where many uh, change initiatives and organizations fall short. I think it, it's like, but we have to do this because it's like, no, it's, it's you know, I, at some level, I think people have to connect to the emotional reasons, the benefits, the... Um, they've got to be able to see that there's something in it for them in, in, in making that shift because it's a tremendous amount of energy and effort to invest. And people will move towards change at the speed with which they're comfortable. And so we can't put it on a timeline. You, you know, we can, we can line up all the good reasons why. And yet we can only, certainly as leaders, we can only invite people to step into that place and, and provide them with the support, you know, to move through it. But we cannot convince them to go. They've got to they've figure that out for themselves. So what's the biggest obstacle to innovation as you see it? Oh, wow. Um, I think there's... There's so many ways you can look at <laughs> the obstacles to innovation. You know, if you want to look at it at an organizational level, if you want to look at it at a personal level, there's so many different ways to be looking at it. Um, one of the things that I've found is that one of the, the bigger obstacles is people not actually having. Uh, so if we look at it from an organizational standpoint, most organizations will implement innovation or say, hey, we're going to innovate, we're going to go off in this new direction without having a framework to guide that effort. So they aren't paying attention to the dimensions of people, process, uh, the context within which they're working, and they aren't paying it, you know, they aren't necessarily figuring out how the product of their innovation, whether it's a new product, new service, whatever it is they're innovating, a business process, they aren't, they aren't understanding how that all connects in. And, and I, I would call that not being mindful <laughs> about how we're innovating. And, and, and so when we don't pay attention to that, that's when, when things start, you know, we start to find that, that that battle's a little more uphill than we need it to be. So I'd say that's one thing. Um, I think another thing is often there's not a strategy around it. Um, you you must have seen this yourself in many, right? It's innovation is this big idea, but there's not a strategy to clarify what that means. And again, I think that goes back to that framework and making sure that you have that. So uh, to yeah. me, those are two of the co a, a couple of things. And then I think also we forget that it's people who are innovating, and yeah. there's an entire psychological. Uh, aspect to that, that if we aren't paying attention to, it, it makes it difficult for people to do that really well. And with, with the confidence that they can go off into that new territory. So those right. are my top three. What do you think? I totally agree. I think that it's like, it's, it's both sides. I see, I see it like top down and bottom up. So top down, it, it should come from the organization level, from the strategy, from the leaders, having these vision, the vision and the goals and understanding, and then really talking to these people who need to really execute in the end. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, the people who need to execute and provide all the, you know, the great ideas and to really try them out and then go about and do something with that and implement them. They need to really believe that they could do it. And even if they fail and they might do, it will be okay and um, because if they are if they don't feel distressed and they are not sure it will be uh, fine they will not do it and it's hard to really believe uh, before you try it out yeah i think you're you're bang on um the way i like to explain it to leaders i'm working with 
because often innovation in organizations gets, as you say, rolled out from a top level where it's like, hey, this is what we're going to do. But the actualization of that is left to uh, mid-level and first-line managers to figure out how does that go, right? And so without a lot of guidance other than, a, hey, we should be more innovative, they've got to figure out what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. And, and and I think that it, it really comes down to this. It, it, it comes down to what is it that you expect me to do? How do you expect me to behave? Be, be really clear on that, right? What is what does innovation look like? How will you know when I'm doing that well? What what are you expecting of me? And we we generally say to people, well, just be more creative. Just think out of the box. Just do this. Just, right? No, yeah. no, no, no. What is exactly the behavior you are expecting of me? Because if we don't have clarity on that, it becomes difficult for me to do that behavior on a regular basis and bring myself into accountability when I may be having difficulty to do something different, right? So, so I need to understand, what do you expect of me? And then I think we need people to understand, is it safe for me to do this? So if I put my neck out, what's going to happen? Can I trust that you've got my back? Is it okay? I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into organizations where people say, but are we allowed to do that? <laughs> They've asked you to think differently. They've given you the training. They've given you this. They've given you that. What do you mean? Are we allowed to do that? Yeah. Has your boss given you any reason to think that he or she doesn't wow. have your back? But are we allowed to do that? Is it okay? Is it safe? And I really think that gets down to getting out of the habit of doing something that, we, that we've done before, right? Because innovation is saying what we used to do isn't what we're gonna do anymore, but we've got to figure out how to, how to build those new habits and new skills from there. And then I think the other thing people are wondering is, so if I do this, uh, what's in it for me? What's the benefit? What's the reward? Um, you know, am I gonna be recognized? Cause man, this is hard, you know, what's going on? So I think that's, it, it comes down to three very simple things that are always going through people's heads. And, and they're trying to translate that into their day-to-day -day and, and, and all of the other context of what's expected of them in the organization. Yeah. We have several comments, but one of them is really surprising. Mamuda from Saidi says, greeting from Gambia. I never thought that somebody from there will, will – and he said, thanks for the kind message. And uh, some, some people say it's interesting and thank you. So uh, keep, keep it coming. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And these teams who need to, to really work together, how can they collaborate better in order to solve these complex problems and very hard work that we're talking about? No, well, that's what I spend a lot of time doing. Um, I've spent 10 years researching how to help teams do that. And I'm going to say that one of, the, one of the first things is they need to, there, there's a couple of things that need to happen. Uh, most teams form, I, I, let me just put some context on this. Most teams form worried and concerned about what they need to do. Okay. So it's like, oh, we have to build a X, Y, Z by this time. That's the what. But they don't form thinking about how they're going to work together. Now, if you think about what the main function of a team is, we bring teams together to solve problems and make decisions so they can reach their goals, right? right. Yeah. We pay no attention to that. <laughs> and that's why I say, if you're doing innovation without a framework that looks at the people and how you're going to work together, that part becomes difficult, right? So the collaboration becomes very hard. So so the first thing that I do is we've, we've stumbled across, as I was trying to figure out why the teams get stuck, why do they have difficulty moving through challenging situations? And what part of innovation isn't challenging, right? When they're dealing with, with, with the uncertainty or whatever. So I was very curious about that. And I went looking for something that would solve that problem and help them collaborate. And I came across something called Foresight. And I've been using it since 2002. Now, that is not F-O-R-E, Foresight. That is F-O-U-R, Sight. And it's a fantastic tool because what it does is it gets to the fact that what the, of how we engage in creative process. So think about collaboration as 
a creative process. We're coming together with people to figure out how to do something that we all want to do. And so what I like about this is that it gives an assessment where in 10 minutes it will tell you how you prefer to engage in creative process. But then it creates a roadmap to show you what does that mean for when you collaborate, when you're innovating, and when you're solving problems. So all of a sudden you have a really good understanding of who you are in that process and you understand where you need to flex and work a little differently in order to get a good result. So to me, that's one of the most effective ways because it, it, it gets to the language we're using. It looks at how we're delegating our work with each other. It looks at how we're communicating it and, and it gives us a process for thinking so that we understand how to move through that together and we can communicate when to each other in a very respectful way uh, when we're not doing what we need. So to me, it's we've got to break down what is the process of collaboration and, and what does the thinking, we have to remember that we are thinking through that process to solve problems and that will help to ease the collaboration. Now there's a whole bunch of other things you can do with that once you have that information, but, but to me, that is just the essence of it. If I do not understand who I am, as a creative person or as somebody who can move through that thinking process, how the heck am I going to understand who you are and, and how do I understand how to work with you when we start to run into difficulty? And that's like innovation is it's nothing more than solving problems. That's what it is at its essence. Does yeah. that Yeah, it makes sense. But if I have something that I need and you work with me and my team and you need something which is completely different how do we negotiate the needs in a certain stage in order to get to a result that we are both pleased with and we can really collaborate well I think there you're talking about the cross-functional aspect of innovation right mm -hmm. so I think I think there's a couple of things that we need to remember the context within which I'm working and in innovating in one part of the organization might be completely different or unaware to the other person yet, my success is dependent on them. So if I have a language and a way to connect them to that broader context of what I'm trying to do, and I can enroll them in, hey, this is where I'm going, this is what I'm doing, and this is why I need your support. And then I can communicate clearly with them what aspect of the thinking is that I need from them, then I have a very different place to have that negotiation. Right. And again, there's always going to be the I don't have the time. I don't have the this. I don't. Have, but let's just say if I can go to a group and be much more clear about what it is that I need, the role that I expect them to play, um, you know, what their benefits for participating and helping in that will be. If I can connect what I'm doing to what they're doing. Right. Then then there then we create that place where we can meet. Right. Because it's got to be. It's got to be a negotiated win-win collaboration. But if I don't come to that with clarity around, I'll go back to what I said. What do I expect of you? Um, you know, here's why it's going to be safe for you to do this. Here's here's why it makes sense for us to do this together. And here's the, here's the reward for you if you do it with me. And so if we can then work to find those dovetails, I think it's a lot easier to bring people together. I've been doing this for 15 years and we have not had anybody say, no, we won't help. Because if you go to them with a different language and a different process of how that engagement, how that collaboration is going to work, they want to come. And, and they want to be part of that. Yeah. We touched in the fact that we're in the middle of the COVID crisis. And uh, before you told me about uh, the latest study you had about the impact of COVID on creativity and teams. So we would love to hear that. Yeah, I, um, I did uh, my master's degree in creativity and change leadership at the International Center for Studies in Creativity in the U.S., and every year we get together as, a, as an alumni and we talk about what we've been doing and things that have inspired us, research that we're done. We're very much a research-based community. And in this past week, I had the benefit of listening to a couple of my colleagues talk about a study they did where they talked to 22 leaders uh, in about four different, con three different continents. So they were in Mexico, Canada, the US, and they may have done a little bit in Europe. 
And they went to senior level leaders and they asked about the impact of COVID on creativity, organizational creativity. They wanted to know what's been going on because, you know, we've all seen, you've probably seen lots of stuff. And, and what, we're, what we're finding is that there's a, there's a couple of things that we're finding and the, the, the way that they pulled together the data helped put a lot of words around what many of us have been seeing and hearing from our own clients. So we're mixing up the concept of productivity and just getting things done with creativity and innovation. And I, and I might sound funny, like, so we, we, we had this mass change that came over across our workplaces and people were sent home and now we're working in different ways, we're using different technology. And so there was this impetus to just make that happen because there was very much a fear-based factor around it. People were concerned about their jobs, people were concerned about their businesses, people were concerned about getting sick. So there was a lot of activity around, let's just get it done. And what a lot of organizations did was they made decisions around doing that, thinking that it was going to be temporary. Yeah, hoping. Right, we all hoped it would be temporary, but now right. we're finding that those knee-jerk, quick survival type things that we did and let's face it we were productive we got it done we got things working we were able to keep operations going but we didn't take the time to necessarily think through all the implications and now we're suffering from that in that we're finding that as this goes into a longer time frame and we're realizing this might be the future of work or it's going to be very different they're starting to realize that there's some shifts around it a couple of other things that they found is that in the past, if I wanted to be creative and I wanted to get my team into a brainstorming session, right? What did we do? We were at the same location. We ran into a room, whether we knew how to do brainstorming well, whether we had a deliberate process, we hummed a few bars, we got it done. We threw sticky notes up on the wall and we got something. Well, now leaders are bearing most of the brunt of trying to figure out how do I do that in a virtual space? And the problem isn't, the problem to solve is not what technology do I use? The problem they're having difficulty solving is how do we actually collaborate when we can't see each other in the same way or we can't be there to experience that emotion in the same way. And most organizations do not have a deliberate process for collaboration, nor do they have a deliberate process to tap that creativity. So it's haphazard and, and, they're, and they're struggling and having difficulty with that. So that's, those were a couple of the highlights from it. And it was like, okay. And you know, when I look at what we've had to deal with with our own clients in the past uh, year, we've spent more time helping them figure out how to take what they're learning about collaborating and, and, and using deliberate creative process. We've spent more time helping them understand how to translate that into a virtual environment than we have had to teach them how to actually do that collaborative, collaborative aspect. It's, it's that transition piece because that's still new for a lot of people. Yeah. I can tell you that when I have a group of people and we're doing a workshop, like in the past, face to face, there is something happening in the room. And it's not only that I understood each one of the people and they understood each other because, you know, they hear the word, they know the meaning, but there is something happening, you know, with enthusiasm, with what they're feeling, with the joint experience and, and it, it not, it's, it's no, in, no interruptions. It's very like we're all in the same space mentally and physically and now the fact that we're just taking from our daily life, like a minute ago, I was with my kids and now I'm here and fi in five minutes, I'm going to go somewhere else. And each one of us is, is separate in his own like life cycle of what he's doing. And we're not together. It's much harder for people to do it. It's not about only the attention span or, you know, that we are fatigued from, from all the time doing online. It's something that happens when people do things together. And, and I feel that people know more about that, although it was like obvious in the past. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you to some extent. I, there's definitely a lot of power to having people in a room together. And boy, I hope we can get back to that place eventually. But in the meantime, we've got to figure out how to, 
how do we create that? And one of the things that I've found most surprising over the past uh, year, you know, of course, I'm not on planes flying everywhere anymore, neither is anybody else. So, you know, we're doing our work in a very different way. Luckily, we already knew that. And we've got the benefit of understanding how to how to focus people in that collaborative process. So back to your question, when I have when I have a process, when I have a language, when I have a way to get people to focus on that, even if they've been distracted by their kids or their cat or their dog, and they only have an hour to give me, I can make that really, really productive and creative in that space. And the, the, the thing that I found most surprising was the, the level of breakthrough that we were able to help people get to uh, when we were very disciplined around the process, where we were very sensitive to the time they had available, and we created the safety in that environment, despite the fact that it was uh, online, that allowed them to come in and out based on what other demands were there. But because we could explain, look, here's where we are, at the end of this meeting, this is where we're going to be. Here's the thinking we're going to go through. Here's the process we're going to use. And, you know, be here for it as you can. And we just we just kept going. But I think that the benefit of that is that I or somebody on my team or somebody was in charge of holding that space for the team, right? Someone was in charge of that process. Very much like when you are doing your workshops, You've got the process. You're holding that container. And the problem I think many organizations are, and teams are experiencing right now is who's holding the container? Who's creating yeah. that space? And how are we allowing that energy to, to, to synchronize so that we can get that good thinking and, and, and have that experience? So yeah. it's possible. I think it takes a different level of skill. I think yeah. it's a lot more... Uh, you do need to be very deliberate about the process. And, and I think that's, you know, that's the flexibility. That's the place for growth. It's not about what tech tools we're using. It's about how are we, how are we helping this hook up to this so, so that we can get that created or, 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 or managed in, in a virtual environment. That's, that's the growth. Yeah. We have a comment from one of our viewers, Yvonne Flomo. It's what your work style desires allow, not necessary, necessary, better or worse. I experienced more productive, creative virtually. And he says in one hour remotely so much more in, I, is achieved in one hour, hour in person in the room. So it seems that, yeah, people see that sometimes even like even being more. So th thank you, Yaron, for being a part of, the, of this conversation. So could you tell us a use case from one of your clients and how you help them go through hard times? Oh, gosh. Well, it depends on what do you want to call as hard times. I mean, I think, you know, I, 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 we, we have many, many situations that people will, will engage us in. Um, it's, it's often the, the hard time is they aren't doing it they realize that they're not collaborating across the organization in the way that they want um so i've got a use case around that and i've and the other one i've got is um you know a senior level team a senior leadership team that is tasked with leading innovation and is realizing that they're having some difficulty with it so what's what's the difficulty you want to hear about <laughs> the second one sounds really really interesting okay. to me Okay. So because I'm I'm calling the shots, I can decide between <laughs> them. <laughs> okay. So um, here's the situation. Uh, Canadian senior leadership team, IT organization. Uh, ran hoops, did amazing things for the last two years, uh, creating change in their organization, completely restructured their operating model. Uh and were doing some pretty cool things in the new tech and the way that they were attempting to service their clients. The leaders though, were tasked with two things. They wanted to bring more of the decision-making down into the organization so that people weren't so dependent on them as they were moving through the change or as they were starting to you know, really 
hardwire this into the reality of what they do. And the other thing they wanted to see was um, they wanted they wanted to be creating this culture of innovation. And I'm sure you've heard this many times, right? They want they wanted a more innovative culture, and they wanted to be able to drive decisions down into the organization. But there was a lot of um, concern in the in the leadership team around how they trusted each other and how they collaborated. So they had a very tense cooperation together, but they weren't really collaborating. And what it came down to was how they were valuing each other as contributors to the overall goal. Now, I want you to step back and think for a second. Innovation is about creating value. And if I'm sitting at a table of senior leaders and I'm responsible to implement an objective that we all have, and I don't think you value me, and I don't, I don't know that I value your contribution, then how the hell are we ever gonna get to a place where we can be really cohesive and work well together? And what we did was we took this team through foresight. We gave them their language for collaboration. We showed them what this looks like. We showed them what good collaboration looks like. And then we sat down and we did a very simple, simple, exercise and I got them all to tell each other what they thought the value was that they brought to the table. Not from the thinking, but from the decisions. You know, what's the piece they're holding? What's the watch out that they're having? What what are they trying to keep in play? What are they most concerned about from the seat they occupy about how this organization is functioning? And in 90 minutes, we had a breakthrough with this team because for three months they had been telling me they still weren't quite sure about the value, but we needed to take them through some of the other things first to start showing them how they can build some of the trust and, and give them some process skills. And we got them out working with their teams, but we broke through that issue with that team with that and it was a it was a big aha for all of them because what they started to realize it wasn't just that everybody was solving problems in a different way it was also that there was a different world view they were all bringing and it didn't mean that the world view i had was in contrast to what yours was it wasn't meant to compete with you it was just this is my reality and so we were able to get them to a place where they could have a much better conversation about that and, and deal with it. So I, you know, it's I always find it interesting that in many organizations, when when the goal is innovation, there are challenges around value. We, you know, right, we 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 have difficulty not only with the value we're creating, but how the value we bring to the table is perceived. And this is a team that, you know, there were a number of new players. There was a lot of history, right? It's like any organization. There's always yeah. somebody who's been there for a while and then there's a few new kids on the block and everybody's posturing at a senior level trying to figure out how to, how to, uh, how to make their mark, how to, how to have that impact in the organization. And it, and it was a really, again, it, it, it was a benefit of a conversation that had safety around how we were engaging in that conversation. I, they would not have had that conversation without us facilitating it. But, you know, in 90 minutes, less than 90 minutes, we were able to get them to that aha of, okay, and, you know, now we've got all of this other stuff that we can build on and now we can go to this next level. So that's yeah. one of the stories. Yeah, I love the story. And we have Frank here. Uh, thanks, Frank, for the, for the question. Which formats for digital creative collaboration do you advise? Oh, wow. That's cool, Frank. Thanks for that question. Um, <laughs> okay. First off, I get no payment and no, or, no, no endorsement <laughs> for any of these people. Let's be very clear. Uh, second off, I'm going to say that the best thing is based on what it is you need to do. And I think a lot of us have been experimenting with tools, doing our best, trying to make things happen. So what I found is it's better to keep things simple. We don't want to overburden people. So it depends if you're, so my biggest thing is this, you need a place. If you're in creative collaboration, you need a way to capture everyone's thinking. So that's my primary thing. 
If you think about what happens when you go into a room, what are we all doing in innovation? We're writing things on post-its and we're sticking it on a wall. So how are you going to recreate the ability to be transparent and heard? That's, that's the first thing that I ask for and look for. The next thing I'll do is I'll say, what does the client need? Because let's face it, if we're in the corporate world, there are all kinds of constraints about what can be used on the network. So we have to do a lot of testing and we have to have a lot of flexibility. So here's a few tools that I have found tremendously helpful over the last few months. Well, no, actually, it's now last year, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it's scary. a year. It's just scary <laughs> to think about it. But anyway, it's it is. And you know what? I am the I'm the person who went, I do not want to be the tech. I do not want to be the tech advisor. I want to be the people advisor, okay? I left a job at IBM because they wanted me to be too technical. It was like, no, no, I want to work with the people, with the tech. Um, mm. So a uh, couple of tools I love. Uh, let's make sure that I say the names right. I love mind mapping. There is a huge amount of power when you can open up MindMeister. There you go. There's the plug for them. And you can get everybody to literally the same blank page and you can allow them in real time to mind map their thoughts. And it's amazing because if you know how to do this, you can get everybody doing it, uh, doing their own thing. And then you can step back and look at it. OK, another tool that we've used with some good experience is Mural um, and it sets up whiteboards. It's been kind of interesting, um, you know, for the work we do. I find that it takes a lot of prep and, and experience. It's a little clunky at first for some people. But once we get them over some practice exercises and show them how to do that, it seems to work quite well. Um, and then my favorite tool, if we have the benefit of doing it, is a, a tool called Storms. S-T-O-R-M-Z. And what it does is it recreates, it's a platform that recreates the entire flexibility of designing a workshop where people can interact and not only interact, but see the data as it comes live. And then at the end of the workshop, there is no need to do anything other than press a button and get all of your data beautifully organized exactly as it showed up, which is what I find a lot of tools aren't doing. So you get, you know, you can do your mind map, you can do your, your mural, and it's difficult in my mind to pull everything off in a way that you can use it easily um, to take it to the next stage of thinking. You're just getting images of things, whereas Storms allows you to manipulate the data and pull it and, and move it into yeah. something else. So I'm going to say those are three of my favorite. There's others, um, but I just I just find those seem to get most of the job done with the group. So I hope that helped to answer your question. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Frank, for the question. Actually, we have so many additional questions that we had like lined up, but we are uh, more or less finished with our time. So I want to thank you for your time. Before we finish, I'll add the links that you just mentioned and links to your great blog. And I want to ask you where people could find you and ask more questions and contact you with your great work. Thanks very much, Addie. It has been a pleasure. I just love your interview style. I, and, I, and I like the fact that you're a subject matter expert with lots of openness in your heart and in your thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, they can find out more about us at our website, which is bridgepointeffect.com. And uh, we also have another website called collaborationtrainingonline.com if they want to try that. Our Bridgepoint Effect uh, website has our phone numbers and it has our calendar link. And if somebody wants to chat for a few minutes or a little bit longer, please feel free to book that time. We'd be delighted. Yeah, I'm sure you should do it because for me, it's like the second time I talk to Janice and it's always a pleasure. So I advise you to do so. Thank you for your time and thanks everyone being with us and all to, to your all change, change makers out there. Thank you for joining us. I'll see you next week. You're much invited to InvincibleInnovation.com if you want to know more. Have a great day. Thanks, Janice. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I'm Adima Zaukario, and you've been listening to the Invincible Innovation Podcast. 
make sure to visit our website, invincibleinnovation.com, where you can learn more about our programs and my book, Innovating Through Chaos. I'll be waiting for you next week in our next episode. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.